Welcome to Free Life Chapel, where we help you discover and live the free life in Christ. My name is Angie. We're so excited that you decided to tune in with us today. Feel free to check out our website, freelifechapel.org, to find out more about who we are, what we do, and how you can be a part of it. If you ever find yourself in the Central Florida area, come visit us. Free Life Chapel would love to connect with you. But until then, we have an awesome message in store for you. Check it out. What is this Bethlehem series all about? This series is about things that happened in Bethlehem leading up to the birth of Christ. Jesus didn't just appear on the scene. This was all a plan. It was all set up. We kicked this off two weeks ago, talking about Ruth and Boaz. I'll get into that in a minute. And then last week, Pastor Caleb brought the word last week. Gosh, dog. Talking about David being chosen out of order, setting it all up. Ruth and Boaz, that story, if you remember that story, it all happened in Bethlehem. David being anointed to be the next king when he's 15 years old, that happened in Bethlehem. It was all a plan. In fact, look at what Micah chapter 5 is, the anchor verse for the entire series. Here's what the Bible says in Micah chapter 5 verse 2. Bethlehem Ephrathah. Though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come from me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are of old from ancient times. God made a plan. I'm going to bring my son. I'm, I'm putting my son in the earth to redeem humanity. And after God set, decided the plan, then God backed up to the beginning and started all of the events that would need to happen in order to bring this to pass. God actually planned for Jesus to be born in Bethlehem before Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 was written. Do you know that Revelation chapter 13 tells us that the lamb, speaking of Jesus, the lamb was slain before the foundations of the earth? In other words, this has all been a plan. Would you turn to three folk and tell them God's always got a plan. God's always got a plan. God's always got a plan. That's good news because some of y'all think your life is in chaos and out of order, but I'm here to tell you God's got a plan with your crazy self. No, he's working. Y- y'all are working heaven overtime right now, but I promise you God's got a plan. He's going to work this out. Ruth was a Moabite. She didn't even belong in Jesus' lineage, but she was one of the matriarchs of Jesus' lineage. In other words, her past didn't stop God's plan. And then David, last week, as, 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 as was preached here, was anointed to be the next king. That means God promoted David out of order because he was the youngest in the family. That should have gone to the oldest in the family. How you know God is into breaking the order up? God will break the rules to get you where you need to be. This is what we see, and it's all happening in Bethlehem. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Isaiah 46 verse 10 says this. Get this in your spirit. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say, my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I... God has an attitude. He thinks he's God. He thinks he can actually do what he wants to do and get what he wants out of life, and that's exactly what he says. He, I planned it. Now I back up and I start the process to get my plan in play. Today I want to pick back up with David. I know we talked about David last week, but you saw that was David 1.0. Today I want to talk to you about David 2.0. We're going to up the game here because David was anointed at 15 years old, that he was going to be the next king of Israel. At the time, Saul was presently the king in Israel. It's not like they didn't have a king, but God said, I've already got a plan. Saul's going sideways, and I'm getting you in line to elevate you to the next season. And so God calls Samuel, the prophet, to go to David's house, and he pours oil on David's head and anoints him for his future to be the next king. And we see David now... 
in the passage we're about to step into, he becomes king. And as David is moving into this kingship, King Saul was so jealous of David that for four years, King Saul pursued David trying to kill him. Assassination attempt after assassination attempt. Some scholars say 21 different attempts on his life to kill him. But David kept eluding, kept moving, skirting the mountains, staying away from King Saul. And David finds himself now in this cave called Adullam. He, he's, he's, it's this, this, this massive cave, and somehow a bunch of men find out about David. And these guys, the Bible says, 400 men. They were misfits. They were frustrated with life. They were in debt. They were just broke, busted, and disgusted with life. And all 400 of them showed up, and they found David. They're all, can you imagine the conversation in that cave? I mean, that had to be a messed up cave, but David is there. 400 of these guys show up, and the Bible says that there was 30 of these guys that were, these were special forces dudes, you understand. Like, 30 of them were boss, man. They were in there, they were Mossad, they were Green Beret, they were Navy SEAL. 30 of them were that level. And David is now in this next passage talking, and he has a conversation with three of them. And I want you to hear what happens with these top three leaders in David's 400 misfits. First Chronicles chapter 11, verses 15 through 19. Check this out. The big three from the 30 made a rocky descent to David at the cave of Adullam while a company of Philistines was camped in the valley of Rephaim. David was holed up in the cave while the Philistines were prepared for battle at Bethlehem. David had a sudden craving. What I wouldn't give for a drink of water from the well in Bethlehem, the one at the gate. The three penetrated the Philistine camp, drew water out of the well at the Bethlehem gate, shouldered it, and brought it to David. And then David wouldn't drink it. He poured it out as a sacred offering to God, saying, I'd rather be damned by God than drink this. It would be like drinking the lifeblood of these men. They risked their lives to bring it, so he refused to drink it. These are the kinds of things that the big three of the mighty men did. This is crazy. These three guys were so boss they took on the Philistine army to go get a jar of water because David said, oh, man, I just, I just wish I could taste that water. What do you mean taste that water? How does David know what that water tastes like? He grew up in Bethlehem. That's where he was anointed to be king. And now here we are 50. 15 years later, that's how long it took between God's promise and the provision from hitting in David's life. 15 years. Can I tell you something, ladies and gentlemen? It doesn't all happen at once in our life. God starts some things in our life, and then it takes a minute to get there. Anybody ever been in a delay in your life? You're like, God, are you there? Do you care? Your word says this, but I'm living in this. Something ain't jiving here. God has a plan, and he's working this thing through. You see, David David is now 30 years old, and he's been anointed. He's been crowned the king of Israel. But during those 15 years, some things had to happen. Number one, he had to wait 15 years for the promise. That means he had to learn to trust God. And then he had to fight 15 years for the promise, which means he had to work for the promise. And then he had to grow in 15 years into the promise, which means he had to be pursuing God the entire time. Here's what I'm telling you. Just because we have promises from God doesn't mean we're entitled. No, there's some stuff we got to do. The promise is just the beginning. There's some work you got. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, you got some work to do, Slick. You got some work to do. We got some growing to do. I, I, I got to invest in this. God made some big promises, but all that does is it excites me. It gives me a picture of my future. But God doesn't do it for me. God does it with me. Oh, I think I'll say that again. I'm gonna, God doesn't do it for me. God does it with me. God says, I'm not going to do for you what you can do for yourself. You do your part. I'll do my part. And together, you're going to get everything I promised in your life but we got to do this thing together David was officially the king but watch this and still facing giants he had arrived 
and still had a fight on his hands. Ah, yeah. can, can, I, can I just tell you this? God's plan for your life comes pre-wired with a fight against the impossible for your life. No, no, he's already got it laid out. So like, I can't believe what I'm facing. What did I do? You didn't zig when you should have zagged. No, you're in a place and you're moving forward and God pre-wired your life for things that like, I can't get through this. You don't believe me? When God called Noah, God pre-wired Noah to have to go through a flood that killed everybody else. But he was anointed to get through what nobody else could get through. No, no, when, when God called Moses, Moses, I got a plan for you. God pre-wired Moses with a Pharaoh and an Egypt and 430 years of bondage that I want you to break people out and I want you to bring my people through the Red Sea. Daniel, I've pre-wired you to sleep with lions all night long. Nobody else can do that. You're going to face some things because I pre-wired you. Jesus, I pre-wired you for a cross and a grave. It's a part of your destiny. Oh, there will be a resurrection. I didn't want to mention that. But, but, but God says, I know how to bring you out, but I've already prepared you for this. In other words, there's some things you're going to face in life that you're not going to like. And there's no point of reference for you to look to that somebody else split a Red Sea and somebody else can slept with lions all night. But God has a plan for my life. And even though i got a fight in front of me, if God be for me, who can be against me? Everything is going to be all right, I'm wired for this. This is why you and I have got to make sure that we got our proper head on our shoulders. You are pre-wired to face and overcome some giants that are bigger than your ability. This is why you need Jesus. No, 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 no. Life is beyond your capacity to handle without God. You were never meant to do life without him. You were never meant to do life without coming together like this. We need this worship. We need the word. We need the fellowship. We need the encouragement. This is life-giving to us because you're facing some things this week that you can't handle without him and without his plan for your life. We need him. You see, you're going you're to need Jesus to do this thing. That, 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 that's exactly right. You're, you're not here to fit in. You're here to take over. You're not here to be nice. You're here to move forward and advance. That's why you can't quit. You've got to keep fighting. Jesus did not die for you to live in a place called almost. He died for you to live in everything that he died to give. He, I paid the price for it. Now enjoy it. It's called life. That's where you and I are headed. So whatever you're facing right now, whatever giant you're facing, it isn't big enough to stop God's plan for your life. Get that in your head. That's a, that's a good tattoo. Down your left arm, that entire arm right there. Whatever you're facing, it's not big enough. In business, in your family, the addiction, I don't care what the doctor said, it's not big enough to stop God's plan for your life. You've got to believe what his word says. Somebody shout, keep fighting. These three bad dudes, man, the Bible gives us their names. One dude's name is Adino. The Bible tells us that he killed 800 men at one time. That's one bad dude right there. That's all I got to say. Oh, what about this guy? What about Eleazar? He fought some enemies so much that his hand froze to the sword that he was fighting with. They had to pry his fingers open off the sword because he was in a grip so long and destroying so many. This is what the Bible tells us. What about this one? This is a good one. Shama. Shama was the third one. The Bible says the Philistines showed up, the enemy showed up and, uh, during harvest time, and he had a, a, a bean patch. And Shama stood in the middle of his bean patch, and he took them all on and killed every one of them because they were coming for his beans. you got to be loving some beans at that point. That's all i got to say. He probably had some cornbread to go with them pintos. You understand? So, I'm, just, I'm sorry. Let me get back here. These are the three dudes that David said, man, if I could just taste the water. They said, we got you. Boom. They broke through, brought back water. When they got the water to David, the Bible says David refused to drink it. He's holding the very thing that he said, oh, if I could just taste it. They said, your wish, our command. You're our leader. We don't play. Anything you say, it becomes a directive for our life. 
They went after it and they brought it back. And David's holding it. And the Bible says that David poured it out. Well, why did David pour it out? Number one, I want you to understand there's two things in this story we got to wrap our head around. Number one, when he poured it out, he was worshiping God. What do you mean worshiping God? How do you do that? In the Bible, it's called a libation offering. That during different parts of worship in the temple, the priest would hold a glass of wine, especially in the beginning of the brand new season, and he would pour it out to God. In other words, before we drink and enjoy any of it, we will pour it out. Why can we pour it out? Because you're the giver of all things, and we lose nothing because you are the source of our life. Not what we have here, but you are the one that gives life. So we will pour it out to you. David was saying, I'm not worthy of the sacrifice that you men paid in order to to get this, all the worship and all this glory belongs to God, not me. This is why Paul said, Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, he said this, I will rejoice even if I lose my life pouring it out like a liquid offering to God just like your faithful service is an offering to God and I want all of you to share that joy here's what you have to understand uh, pouring that out that libation offering was to be a picture of you and I and how we live our life that it's I'm supposed to empty myself to make room for him and here's the thing about pouring the water out once David poured it out on the ground there was no way to go and regain gather it. It was gone. In other words, it's total commitment. I'm pouring my life out to you, God. I'm emptied of myself. I give you all that I am, so much so that there's nothing I can take back. I do everything for your glory. I do everything for your will. I do everything for your honor. Take all of me. Paul said, I'm pouring myself out. You and I are called to live our lives as an offering that is poured out before God. God, take all of me and get glory out of all of my life. I deserve none. You deserve it all less of me more of you ladies and gentlemen that's the only way to live life when you and I are trying to live life for ourselves and please ourselves and do it for me we always somehow keep coming up half empty but as long as I keep pouring myself out God keeps filling me full again when you do it God's way you get God's results pour it out but the second thing that happened when David poured it out and this is what just this is this is what I believe with all my heart not only was David worshiping God with it, but he was saying this, you got to stay thirsty. If I take a drink of the cup, I might be satisfied and not pursue the city. You see, the Philistines, the enemy, were in Bethlehem. David had already taken over Jerusalem and he had been set up as king but just six miles outside of Jerusalem is this little town called Bethlehem and David said I want that city that city belongs to me it's not just Jerusalem it's Bethlehem that's my hometown that's where I belong my family my roots I want that town and when David went there there was enemies standing inside of Bethlehem that had taken over that's when he said oh if I could just taste the water of Bethlehem he said I want to go back to where I was I need to go back to Bethlehem Bethlehem is where I belong that's the whole deal and the Bible says that when they brought the water back not only did they pour it out but David in his heart's mind said this why settle for a cup when I actually own the entire well oh I'm talking to somebody today don't you settle in life. Well, I'm so glad that life is working good, but I want you to know there's more. I'm so glad that you got through the last crisis, but there's better on the way. Don't you just settle and say, that's as good That's good enough. No, enough is a dangerous word when it comes to your faith. you got to realize I was made for more than this right here. I'm grateful for where he brought me through in 23, but I'm expecting more in 24. Don't you settle for a little when your God said he'll do exceeding abundantly above all you could ask or think according to his power that works in you. That's why Luke chapter 2 says that Bethlehem is called the city of David. Oh, God was working a plan. God had set Ruth and Boaz up. They spit out a little boy named Obed. Obed later on had a boy named Jesse. Jesse had a boy named David. David was anointed king at 15, took the kingship at 30, and now he's set 
setting up. He goes and he takes over Bethlehem. It becomes the city of David so that through the lineage of David, Jesus would come on the scene and arrive in Bethlehem and change the world forever. What I'm telling you is God decided Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. Then he backed all the way up to the beginning and he started the course. He started the people putting the puzzle pieces in place to get to the place that Bethlehem would be that place that Jesus would be introduced to the world. That's why you need to understand your life is not being lived in a vacuum. You are connected to a bigger story than what you understand and God is moving pieces. You can't settle. Don't you stop now. There's more and in fact let me just put it this way. Don't stop. Get it. Get it. Don't stop. Get it. Get it. There's more. Somebody shout, there's more. You got to stay hungry. You got to stay thirsty. Those that hunger and thirst after righteousness will be filled. You got to keep praying big prayers. You got to keep worshiping. You got to keep showing up. You got to keep dreaming. You got to keep serving. You got to keep speaking life over your family. You can't stop. I know it doesn't look good and you hit a rough spot, but God is able. Somebody's got to keep fighting. Somebody's got to keep pushing. Somebody in your house has got to believe that the best is yet to come over your family, over your children. You got to keep fighting. You got to keep pushing. The Bible says that when David and his men showed up, it was harvest time. Harvest time. The enemy of your life always shows up to steal the harvest out of your life. All of your prayer, all of your faith, all your believing, all your giving, all your trusting, all your serving. There is a reward coming, and the enemy shows up at harvest time. Why? Because he wants you to make he wants to make you think that God doesn't see, that God's word is not true, he doesn't care. He dropped you, he bailed on you. It's never gonna work. You're stuck. This is as good as it's gonna get. There's a lid built on your life, but the devil is a liar. No, God's plan, God's word is in full motion in your life. And even though you don't see something happening right now, it might be in a 15-year delay. But God is working all things together for your good and for his glory. That's what he's doing. Don't you settle for half. Jesus died for you to have it all. Not just a cup of peace. You need a well of peace. Not just a cup of joy, you needed an ocean of hope. Not just a, not just a, 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 a cup of, of hope, but a river, a river flowing in your life. God says, I've got more than you can handle. My supply is greater than your present. So I'm saved, but I'm not finished. I want every promise heaven has for me. No, no, I'm, I'm blessed, but I'm still reaching. I want my kids serving Jesus. Yeah, I, I, I'm grateful, but I'm still thirsty. I'm, I'm pouring out my life for Jesus. I want, to, I want him to use me at a level he's never used me before. Less of me, more of him. Let's go, let's go, let's go. That's why John 17, verse 4, Jesus was praying. Listen, when Jesus prays, listen to that prayer. Jesus is praying in John 17, and here's what he says. He, read it with me. One, two, three. I glorified you on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. God, Jesus is talking to his father. He said, I bring glory to your name by not quitting. I bring glory to your name by completing those things that you put in my heart. I, I, I'm going after, I will not be denied. I don't care what giants rise. I don't care what time delay is there. I don't care how out of order things are. It doesn't matter what my lineage, what my past is. I'm coming after it. I believe that you're able to turn the situation around. You're good and you're God. All my brothers at Polk CI, God has not dropped you. God has not forgotten you. He's in full play in your life. And although you might think you've been sidelined, no, God is good and his plan is still in full effect. We live our lives bigger than where we are in our circumstances. Things are happening. That's why you can't quit now. No, you can't quit now. You've got to finish strong. Your life brings God glory by refusing to settle no compromise. Acts chapter 13 speaks to David and who he was. And hopefully the prayer of our life. Acts 13 says this. God spoke favorably about David. He said, 
I have found that David, son of Jesse, is a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. After doing God's will by serving the people of his time, David died. In other words, after God's will, there is no life. The only thing to life is serving God. That's, that, that is the total capacity of what makes life worth living. His plan, His word, His promise, His will. Not, not, not my fame, not my notoriety, not are they impressed with me. Who, no, no, God, you shine through me. At work, whether I'm on the ball court, if I'm on vacation, God, use my life. For, even in Polk County. For your glory, the success of your life, the success of my life will be defined by how we serve the purpose of God. Because this life will not mean anything once we hit eternity. And when we look Jesus face to face, that is going to be the moment that's going to make it all worthwhile. You see, God's plan requires you, requires me to keep fighting, to keep believing. I need my brothers in the room to speak life over your family. I need you. I, I, I love seeing dudes who love Jesus in the house worshiping God. I, I love seeing biceps and deltoids elevated and honoring God. I'm all about that right there. If you can have a Dino and Shama and Eleazar special forces honoring God, then we can show up and we can honor God too. But we're fighting for our homes and we're fighting for our kids and we're fighting for wholeness and oneness and peace. Yes, we are. Oh, we need some ladies in the room who are fighting for your house. We need your voice loud. We need you going hard. We need you believing God's promises over top of the circumstances you're facing. We need you looking at them babies and say, you on my nerves right now, but you're going to serve Jesus for the rest of your life. Yes, you are. You're going to live in this house, sleep in my bed, eat my food. You're going to church Sunday. Yes, you are. That's how we roll in here. We fight. We fight. We push. We get hit by life. We have giants that rise. Can I tell you what giants are? When you take on this mindset, giants are only a marker to prove to you that you've arrived at a place of promotion in your life. They're not there to keep you out. They're there they're just to identify there must be value inside that place because there's no reason for a hell to show up and try to keep me out of a place that has no value. If you're facing a battle right now, it's because on the other side of this battle is a victory that's going to elevate your life, that's going to be joy in your house, that's going to flood your home with a peace, a hope, a healing that hell can't stop once heaven gets involved. Somebody shout, Fight! You got to keep fighting. You see, David wasn't just fighting for his kingdom. It wasn't just about the city of David. No, God was using David to set up Bethlehem for the arrival of Jesus. It was prophesied by Micah, the first verse we just read, 700 years before Jesus arrived, that he would be born in Bethlehem and rule and reign. You see, your, your fight is bigger than you. And God is using your life to put Jesus on display for others. That's why you can't quit. Some of you have people at work watching you right now. And you don't even know how they're watching you. They want to see how you handle the craziness in our culture, how you deal with the hits at work. When, when word starts going here that things are unstable, do you have peace or are you freaking out like everybody else? No, no, I'm, I'm resting in him. God's got me. I'm working my part. God will do his part. We're going to move. Yeah, they're, they're watching. Your kids are watching you, mom and dad. They're watching you. You can, you can say what you want. They're watching how you live. They're watching how you worship. They're watching if church matters. They're watching to listen if God's word is spoken in your house they're watching 
You don't understand the power that's going on through your fight, through your consistency, just showing up on Sundays, coming in here and honoring God. And we don't have to re-decide every week. No, God's house is where we belong. We're fighting. We can't afford not to be in God's house. Let's go, let's go. This is the fight that we're in, and heaven is using your life to put Jesus on display. Would you stand to your feet in this room? I'm done. Here's what I'm telling you. David's life tells us two things. Worship God by emptying yourself. I live for your pleasure. I live for the applause of one. It's about you and your kingdom. Because outside of you, life is not worth living. I want to be known as a man who had a heart after God. I want people to look at me and say, we didn't always understand him, but he loved his God. He was faithful to his God. Pour yourself out. And number two, never settle. Keep believing. Keep reaching. Keep declaring. Keep trusting. Keep fighting. Yeah, keep, 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 stay in the battle and don't get tired. Don't settle. Don't compromise. Well, I've gone too far. No, no, no. There's more on the way. God's not finished with your life. If you're still here sucking air, that means God's plan is still in effect in your life. And he doesn't bring you to a place for you to settle in. He brings you to this place to keep stepping higher. St keep stepping stronger. Your best days are ahead of you. Some of y'all been in a fight through 2023. Some of y'all been in a struggle. Some of y'all going through a struggle right now. Someone said the first part of the year was good. Right now, I'm going through some hell right now. Okay. That means for you to get into 24, there's a victory waiting on you in 24 that when you reach that point, hell's going to lose, heaven's going to win, and promotion hits. I'm just telling you right now. For your life, it's going to be worth the fight. And every step you take, every, every battle you face, every giant you take down, you're preparing the way for Jesus' fame to keep hitting those around you, make his name famous to all those in the place. That's exactly what happened with Ruth. That's what happened with David in a couple of seasons of his life. It's all happening in Bethlehem. And I can't wait to get you to next week to bring it to the crescendo and show you that's what all of that was about. You'll see it on display. God using your life the same way. I want to pray for you today because you can't quit. I know you're tired, but you can't quit. I know you're thirsty, but I need you to stay thirsty. Stay thirsty, my friend. I need you to stay thirsty. I need you to stay thirsty. Don't you get a cup of water and go, okay, well, that's all I needed. No, 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 no. The whole well belongs to you. Don't you settle for a cup, not just a cup. The whole well, everything. Somebody shout everything. Somebody shout, I want it all. Tell your neighbor, you can have it all. Just tell him, you can have it all. You can have it all. That's why Jesus died. Father, today we declare your promises and we declare your victory over our situation. Even though we're facing giants, we've been wired for this. We've been prepared for this. This doesn't shock you. You brought us to this place. You allow us to face giants so we can defeat and destroy barriers in our life that advances and moves your plan forward. God, use us. We prayed that prayer. You believed us, so we're coming at you. And I'm praying over my friends today. I'm praying over marriages. I'm praying over singles. I'm praying over students today that, God, you would strengthen them and remind them that you're still in full effect, that we're not just living life as a number, but individually. you got a plan that's at work, that you're not taking us everywhere, but somewhere that every day that we face, it's another opportunity to walk in your perfect will for our life and bring glory to your name. Oh, God, today I speak victory over your people. I speak joy and hope and life over your people that no matter what they're facing, we will not quit. We put hell on notice today that we're not stopping until we get everything God said. We put heaven on notice. We trust your word and we're stepping into it. And we will walk out with victory every day of our life. We thank you today, God, that your promises are yes and amen. If you spoke it, it shall come to pass. We will not quit. We trust you. We're coming for you to honor you. We pour ourselves out today and we're staying thirsty for more 
of you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. We hope this message encouraged you. For more encouraging messages, check out our website, freelifechapel.org. Until then, we hope to see you next time.